Cool. Awesome. Well, I hope, uh, as Jenna mentioned earlier, everyone's not too tired. There's plenty of coffee and tea out there. But uh, just thank you all for, for being here. And again, just excited to uh, get the conversation going. First and foremost, I just want to say uh, the, opinion, the opinions expressed in this presentation and the following slides are solely those of the presenter, which is me, and does not represent any other organization. So my path in the, into the HE community actually started about 17 years ago. Uh, I was introduced after my mom being misdiagnosed with major, depres major depression and bipolar disorder. It took about five to seven years of family inter intervention and a trip to the mental facility to finally learn about her diagnosis when I was just 15 years old. So as you can see, you know, from this first picture to this one, my mom slowly deteriorated both physically and mentally in front of my eyes. And it was definitely difficult because I was just in high school and I was trying to fit in with my peers and then also fit in with the reality of my mom and what life meant with HD. I saw her uh, slowly deteriorate for seven for 17 years. Actually, funny enough, or I don't know, I think it's a sign. Uh, today is actually her eight-year anniversary of, of her passing. So, you know, it's it's tough looking back to to realize how much has changed, not just in HD research, but in my life. Uh, without her being here today. And in five years after learning about HD, I decided to get tested at the age of 20. It's a very personal decision, and I wanted to, to learn what my future held. I wanted to plan for my future, and I found out I tested positive and will end up like my mom one day unless there's an effective treatment or cure. So I had two options, right? The, the fight or flight mentality. Uh, many of you may be able to rel relate to that. And I thought I could either not think about it and just c try to keep it a secret or get more involved in the community uh, by just you know, raising money, volunteering, and sharing my story. And luckily, I, I chose the latter. And it started with a through and through basketball charity event in my local town. And as you can see with my height, no, I cannot dunk the, ba the basketball. So please, uh, you know, my doctor lied to me. He said I was going to be six feet, and then I stopped growing. But you know what? What started with a through and through basketball charity event uh, then turned into getting more involved uh, in the HD community through the Huntington's Disease Society of America, also known as HDSA, as their board president of the local Massachusetts chapter and the board president of their National Youth Alliance, uh, supporting young people. And later, I gravitated towards an organization you all uh, may be familiar with, the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization. Uh, where I, I, I joined their board and recently got more involved with them because I realized the importance of providing support and resources to young people uh, because that was something I wish I had growing up. I wish I had an, H an HDO where there was the right education, the right people who understood what I was going through. And, you know, after that, it's just kind of how do I get more and more involved? Uh, I will say I've I have trouble saying no. I've learned more recently the, the power of no, and it's okay to do what's best for yourself. But uh, in, you know, in 2018, what was amazing was that I had the opportunity to do a TED Talk. Uh, oh, this is, this, I sound so much better now. I'm like, oh, the mic's on. I did, a, I did a TEDx talk in my hometown about my genetic testing story, which led to me having more public speaking opportunities uh, around the U.S. and internationally, and eventually led to a career in the healthcare space where, um, you know, more recently actually I joined a, a small biotech company called Prolinia uh, as their senior manager of patient advocacy and engagement. And you'll hear more about Prolinia from one of my colleagues uh, here today, Andres, uh, in a presentation later. But here's the thing is with, with HD, I was continuing to share my story and I was continuing to be on these podcasts or speaking opportunities. And one of my good friends, you may recognize him, BJ View, who's a, a fellow HD community advocate. We're talk, talking in the summer of 2021. And, you know, he, he mentioned to me how, although it was great to share my story, and I was like, yes, one day at a time, let's be positive, let's stay hopeful, and I'm, I'm all for hope. But one thing we learned is that hope may not necessarily move the needle, urgency will. 
And so that's when I felt like we needed to do something because I always knew I was racing against this invisible clock, but now I felt like I was running out of time before living a life with HD because I wanna be able to participate in studies. But unfortunately, how things work right now, I'm not clinically diagnosed and I only qualify for, there we go. I only qualify for observational studies such as Enroll, uh, a few others that I've participated in, which is great, but if I'm not given the opportunity to participate now, then by the time I may be clinically diagnosed, it's gonna be too late to treat me and, and many of my friends. Um, because I think the challenge for me is there's a lot of people that I've met over the years, I've known as long as 10 years, that unfortunately are either no longer with us or are starting to slowly show symptoms. And it's challenging when we were told about 10 years ago that we may be that last generation affected by HD. And now, you know, standing here today and, and saying, well, some of them can no longer either say that or we just aren't at that stage yet. But that's when, you know, PJ and I started to say, well, let's reach out to different HD community stakeholders. Let's talk to pharma, let's talk to researchers, let's talk to, you know, doctors, patient advocacy organizations to better understand how we can change the way we look at this disease. We kept being told to speak to this, this thing called the Food and Drug Administration, also known as the FDA, and to get better guidance on how do we treat HD prior to someone showing symptoms? How do we gather more data? How do we get more people involved in research today, and yet no one was really stepping up, so that's when PJ and I said, well, let's, let's do something. And so what we decided to do was, it's called an FDA patient listening session. So you may say, well, what is that? What is, a, what is this thing called a patient listening session? It's an opportunity for the FDA to hear directly from family members impacted by HD about their needs and desires relating to clinical trials and treatments. Uh, it's about an hour and a half of virtual opportunity to, to listen, in our case, to seven speakers share about their stories. And our objective was simple. It was to help the FDA better understand the urgency and the needs of the, what's known as the pre-symptomatic young adult community along with their desires and willingness to participate in clinical trials. What's amazing is that after doing that talk with them, uh, the director of neuroscience at the time, his name is Billy Dunn, he mentioned this was the first ever patient listening session accepted by the FDA for a pre-symptomatic population for any disease. And actually just last month, there was another one for the juvenile version of Huntington's disease, JOHD. So for our results, um, we did this last year, July of, of 2022. Um, we had Seven speakers, as mentioned, but what we did was we wanted to make sure we were fully prepared. So we ran a survey for one month to ask the community to get, you know, some people who may be here today took part of that, uh, that survey and we truly appreciate it. But it was to gather their voice, their feedback, and share it with the FDA to understand what we're looking to do. We had 164 qualified responses and you know, the, the seven advocates, including myself, you know, it was, it was a variety of us, uh, gene positive, gene ne negative, at risk, those who are caregivers, those who have participated in actual clinical trials, you know, sharing what it was like, sharing what the risk they're willing to take, their motivation to participate in studies, sharing their fears of their future, sharing, you know, why they want to do something now and not tomorrow. Uh, and we had a great opportunity just to share with 50 plus different uh, attendees from different FDA centers. And ultimately, you know, if you wanna learn more so that we can get into a conversation uh, today is just, you can go to the HGO website or just Google HGO FDA uh, listening session and you'll be able to find it. So ultimately, the data summary is, you know, this pre or early, early symptomatic individuals are willing to participate, willing to take risk and not getting necessarily the proper information today. And what I mean by that is not necessarily understanding, well, how do I get involved? What do I do? How, how does my voice matter? And so, you know, what's next? And that's where you might say, well, Seth, what do we do now? 
while we left that meeting feeling excited and motivated, yet we didn't really see, receive much guidance um, or, or next steps from the FDA about how we can include this pre-symptomatic patients in the clinical trials. And, you know, it, it's challenging, right? I mean, we weren't really told what to expect, but we thought we'd get maybe a follow-up email or maybe like, all right, here's what you need to do now, or here's what we recommend or, or suggest. Um, but it's kind of like this big question mark of, I'm not sure to be honest of, you know, how to do, th how to move forward besides just continuing to advocate for change because it's just, it's something that we just need to continue to do if we want to move forward. But as mentioned before, like, you know, I saw my mom go through it for 17 years. I saw, I've lost friends to this disease. Uh, I see friends now who are starting to slowly, you know, get to that stage where maybe they're showing symptoms, maybe they aren't, um, and, and it's tough um, because I see that could be me one day, and I don't want to be at that place, and so I'm trying to figure out what do I do next. So although I wish I do have a better ending to the story, what I will say is that it's, it's up to us uh, as, as the HD community to do something, to act now, to find ways to support this pre-symptomatic HD community to get into trials today and not wait until we're clinically diagnosed because, again, that's going to be too late to pot potentially treat. And again, I know this is a lot easier said than done, um, but, you know, that's where it's, it's important for us to use our voice, to share, to advocate, to say why we're willing to potentially take a risk to participate in a study, even knowing it may not work, right? And there's some facts of Again, don't quote me on this, but about 80 to 90% of trials don't end up working. But we do find that with the research and with the data, we can continue to move forward and find different information that's gonna help with the next study, that's gonna help with the next movement of a potential treatment option to either slow down or halt the disease in its tracks. So how can you help? How can you get involved? I would say, you know, it's, there's a few different things, right? You can continue to share your story on social media, in articles, on podcasts, or participate in an observational study like Enroll. You know, you heard them right before this talk about it. Um, you can go to their table. You can come, you know, talk to me if you want to hear about my experience with Enroll. Uh, it's a great opportunity to feel like you can give back. But regardless of what the avenue you decide to take, we just all need to have a similar message of saying, hey, we don't want to wait, right? And I don't want to speak for all of you, but I've talked with many here today. I've spoke with many on social, uh, virtually on Zoom, and I feel like we're all at that, p that stage of especially seeing your parent go through it or a loved one go through it. You say, oh, I don't want to be, you know, get to that stage. I want to do something now. And so that's why it's up to us to have that similar message of, of saying, hey, we need to act now. Like, let's self-advocate. Let's, let's make a difference. And I think one of the big things is learn who your decision makers are. I mentioned in the U.S. it's the FDA. I listed out a few others, and I hope I got them right. I mean, I got them through Google. So, again, Google can be good or not so good. But if you don't know, I would say you can always Google who is the FDA of and insert your country, or more importantly, speak, speak to your local HD association. Say, hey, what can I do? You know, can I maybe share a blog post on, uh, in your upcoming newsletter hey, yes, maybe I want to fundraise, or hey, how do I get involved in research? Or I wanted to share my story to make sure that we're pushing things along or, or help in some capacity. And so I'll leave you with this, this quote, which is, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. It's by Barack Obama. <laughs> former U.S. president, I realized, I was like, well, hopefully people know who he was, even though we're in the U.K., but that being said, I, I will say, I know we don't have, all, I don't have all the answers, and you may say, well, Seth, why did I just listen to you talk about not having answers, but what I do know is that everyone in this room, everyone at this Congress, we are the ones that will make that change. We're going to be that generation that paves the way for change to happen, and I think let's continue to have these conversations, but let's continue to voice uh, the, our, our needs and desires to participate now and voice that patient perspective into research early and throughout drug development because that's really how we're going to 
make change happen. So I will leave you with that. I want to open it up for any specific questions regarding the FDA, regarding myself, but also if there's anything HD related you want to talk about, uh, I will be at the Perlinia booth again and you know, sharing my personal perspective now that I'm in industry, it's you know, just letting you know that full transparency. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. All right. Any any questions or comments or anything that you want me to follow up on? Uh, I know you in the back. Yeah, I mean, our, our big thing is, again, this, this started before taking on this new, new job, but our big thing is we're just two volunteers in the community, right? And, and we want to help. We don't want to, uh, you know, I'll say ruffle the feathers. We want to support different HD organizations and say, hey, what can we do to help support this? How can we move the ball forward? And I think there's a couple of things. There's, you know, in the U.S., something called a critical path innovation meeting. It's bringing all these stakeholders together to come to in the same room and just say, hey, what do we need to do? Um, I think the other part is just continuing to get young people to share their story, to advocate, to speak with the uh, industry folks here to say, hey, how can I help? How can I help you get involved and, and just give back? And ultimately, I mean, we don't necessarily have the exact answers of what to do next, but we're hoping that this is just the start of many conversations, not just with the FDA, but with many of you to say, well, I want to do something. And I guess you can say building up that army of folks of saying, I don't want to wait around. I want to do something today. So that's what we really want to do is, is say, how do we change that message from hope into urgency? Again, keeping the hope alive, but saying, well, let's act now. Let's act today. You know, there's other communities out there, such as ALS, that's, you know, making great strides more recently over the last few years. And it's it's amazing to see on social media and, and everything that they're doing, and they're saying, well, we, we don't want to go through that. We want to do something now. They're, they're signing petitions, sending it to the FDA with community members and different HE stakeholders saying, here's our, here's our recommendations to you, FDA. So that might be something else is coming together and saying, what's, what's the two to four steps that we want to share with the FDA that's somewhat aligned with you know, industry, with doctors, with researchers, with patient advocacy organizations, with patients, and saying, hey, if you, if you agree with these, these next steps, sign this petition. Let's make it happen. So that's my, my thoughts. Yes. Oh, behind you. So for, first of all, I am... A just a neurologist, so I'm a physician and a researcher. So uh, uh, I will give my perspective about what you said about FDA and as well as uh, EMA and other regulatory authorities. In general, regulatory authorities uh, take care to science. That's bad to say, but they want to be sure that what we do as researchers is scientifically correct. So stories are absolutely important and uh, of fundamental importance to, or even for a drug to be, to be approved, but they are not enough. What is enough is to be sure of what the science may ensure. And uh, there is a step I want to remind uh, everybody. There, there, there is indeed an important step that is following perhaps what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It is a positional paper of Sarah Tabrizzi uh, published in uh, Lancet Neurology very recently. That's an important step because it, for the first time there is a new way to classify cohorts of patients and subjects and mutation carriers where we may observe for the first time uh, or at least we may try to stratify people who are just a mutation and the people who may have biomarkers and people who may have biomarkers plus symptoms. 
So th this is the first. This is a first step. All the scientific world is changing. It is going. It's moving forward to adopt a, 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 to to get to go into this particular new way to look at the disease. So this is an important step uh, that must be mentioned. So, uh, uh, of course, FDA, I guess, is expecting to understand how we as researchers may propose news on next trials. And uh, to be sure that we don't make the mistake to treat pe wrong people in a wrong way, mm -hmm. We need to prove that a person without signs and symptoms may provide scientific information good enough to, to, to test a drug. Yes. Yeah. Hippocrates no. said uh, first is not to go to do, to do bad to people mm -hmm. before to, to, to cure them. Yeah, and one thing I will say is. is Science is not easy, so I don't want you to think I'm <laughs> thinking science is just, yeah, we could just do this. And, you know, I had some great conversations last night about you got to make sure that, you know, with a potential treatment, it, it's effective, right? And, yes, it's also that it's safe. And one thing that is challenging, right, is that with HD, because it slowly progresses and it's not a, a very fast disease that sometimes it's tough to see those changes in a timely manner. And we want to be able to see those changes first before perhaps treating earlier. I think my thing that I would uh, just challenge from seeing publications and articles is that if we know that changes happen 15 plus years prior to clinical onset, how do we use that data to then say, well, if we're seeing these changes 15 plus years, and we know that as I speak, and this is just not to be like exact, but as I speak, right, there's probably changes happening as I speak. Yes, it's very slow, but if I know that, then how do we make it so that at, one, at some point, knowing I get an opportunity to say, well, I don't want to wait around. I want to be able to participate at some point. I know we'll get there, and I know we have an amazing researchers that are, are doing that. I think it's just, when I, sometimes when I see the science and seeing these changes happen in, in the brain, I say, well, what does this mean for me and what can I do now to, to do something to help you and help many people in this room today? So I definitely agree, science is tough. We need to make sure it's effective. We need to make sure it's safe. But I think it's also is how do we use all the research we have to continue to move forward and is there anything the community can do um, in addition to participating in, in, in role to say, well, we wanna help the researchers move it forward. We wanna help share our stories of why it's so important because someone like me may see my enroll site once a year, but what about those 364 other days where I might be noticing things? Are there ways to track those things via an app or a journal and say, hey, here's additional information I wanna share with you. So I think these are things we could try to think of and get innovated about, but I know I, I saw a hand up there and Ashri, all, all you. Yeah, hi, so uh, Astri, I'm from the European Huntington Association, and I think, of course, science needs to be following careful procedures and all those stuff. But I also realize that it's a very conservative environment. So they need to be challenged of people like you and us and really to, to seek, you know, innovative solutions, and maybe there are other ways to do it, and I fully, fully support you. If, if a person is, is diagnosed with breast cancer, you don't ask them to wait till the lump gets bigger so it's easier to get out there. You, you treat the first second you know it's there. And the same should be the case for us. I mean, I, I know it's more difficult because it's a chronic disease. It's, it's kind of there from the beginning. But at some point in, in, in where the symptoms are really getting troublesome, we should treat. Of course we should, we should and that should be a demand from us. We need to find ways to solve that challenge scientifically, but it should be done. Yeah, and I, you know, I think we are, and I appreciate that a lot, Astri. <laughs> I would say, and that's where conversations like this is so important, right? Is because, yes, it's okay to agree to disagree. It's okay to share our perspectives, but how do we come to that common ground to say, well, e each of us have a very valuable perspective, and how do we come and, and say, let's figure out those next steps. 
let's figure out how we can maybe be a little riskier like the cancer space and saying, well, you know, they do chemotherapy. It's, it's no walk in the park. I know cancer survivors are saying, geez, that was invasive. I had to do chemotherapy, 17 rounds of it, right? But they're like, well, it's either that or I let the cancer spread. And again, I'm not comparing cancer to HD. It's very different, and it's, it's, the research is very different. But if there's a way to get at some point in a similar way where it's making those options available, I think we will bring change to this community. We'll bring change not just to HD, but I think uh, in, in general, the neurodegenerative community of different uh, conditions. So I really appreciate the you know the perspectives of two very in my opinion very well respected uh, people in the HD space and you know again also for for Dan in the back for asking what are those next steps if you do have questions comments thoughts uh, come find me happy to talk but just thank you for hearing some about my personal story and then uh, how I was able to uh, you know interact with the FDA so thank you very much <laughs>